This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off-Track Betting. And as the field comes to the top of the stretch, Johnny Velasquez is just a passive partner aboard Untappable, who takes the lead at the top of the lane. Untappable coming to the eighth pole, just opening up at will. Princess Violet, no match for Untappable. For Untappable is matchless. Oh, look at this. This is just poetry and four-legged motion. Untappable, her march to a title continues unabated here. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Down the Stretch. I'm Mark Cassano. On this morning's show, well, the guests are going to come fast and furious, five of them, beginning in just a couple of moments with Englishman Jamie Osborne, who has sent Toast of New York to New York for the Belmont Derby. He will be followed by Mr. Peter Erton, who's got a fascinating long shot in Dance with Fate for that very same race. Out to Southern California, we'll welcome in Mr. Jerry Hollendorfer, who's bringing the champ shared belief back in the Los Alamitos Derby, then back to New York for Mr. Wayne Catalano, who's got room service for the Belmont Oaks, and we will round out the Big Five with Chad Brown, who will have a busy afternoon in the Belmont Stakes. So all of that, and much, much more if you stay with us for this, our July 5th edition of the program, which is being sponsored by Parting Glass Racing, Saratoga's original racing partnership, Visit them on the web at partingglassracing.com. Good morning once again on an absolutely gorgeous summer Saturday. Hope you're enjoying your Independence Day holiday weekend and hope you enjoy this morning's show. Relax, settle back. It's going to be a busy 55 minutes. All right, before we get to our slew of guests, one race to look back at. The race of the week is the Mother Goose at Belmont and the overwhelming one to 20 favorite number two untappable coming off a very impressive victory in the Kentucky Oaks untappable was facing four rivals who between them had never won a single stakes race of any kind let alone a grade one thus the one to 20 odds tricky spot early on for untappable when she was forced to check as Princess Violet, number three, veered in sharply, but John Velasquez and Untappable recovered quickly, would move to the outside in the clear, would take over, you know, pretty much at will, and would go on to an expected easy victory, this by nine and a quarter lengths. Early leader Princess Violet, a nice New York bred from Mike Hushin, just held second over America, but you know, the connections of those two fillies probably were pretty happy because realistically what they were looking for was grade one stakes placing. Now Untappable is a very interesting daughter of Tappet who failed to progress at the end of her two-year-old campaign. She was awful in the juvenile fillies, then against, you know, a bit of an easier group in the Hollywood starlet, finished a respectable but non-threatening third. She really didn't like the West Coast. But boy, has she progressed this year at three. After absolutely dominating Fairgrounds rivals in both the Rachel Alexandra and Fairgrounds Oaks, Untappable overcame post 12 to capture first grade one in the Kentucky Oaks. And while she didn't really face grade one competition here in the Mother Goose, Untappable is unquestionably the finest three-year-old dirt filly by a rather wide margin in North America. Her next start will likely come in either the July 20th coaching club here at Saratoga or possibly in the July 27th Haskell versus Males at Monmouth Park. And we are up to our first break on this July 5th edition of the show. When we return, Mr. Jamie Osborne will join us as we go to the break, the Gold Cup at Santa Anita and the 4-5 favorite, number one, Game on Dude. 
So we will take a look at a piece of the Gold Cup to the break, back with Jamie Osborne right after these messages. They make their way to the half mile pole and Fury Cap Curry just waiting for them now. He's leading it by just under two. Game on dude is patiently ridden from the second spot in Majestic Harbor. Clubhouse riders in fourth. Now only four and a half separates those first four. They're taking closer order. Imperative been asked to pick it up. Coming to the quarter pole now, and here comes Game on Dude to take them on. Game on Dude. Fury Cap Curry tries to go with him. Clubhouse Ride got a dream run through on the inside. Clubhouse Ride, there goes Majestic Harbor. These two now go on. Majestic Harbor, Clubhouse Ride. Game on Dude has not gone on, and Fury Cap Curry's thrown in the towel. Imperative on the outside. They are homeward bound, and it is Majestic Harbor looking for the upset. Clubhouse Ride, Imperative. Past the eighth bowl they come, and it is all Majestic Harbour striding away from them. Majestic Harbour and Tyler Bays have the Grade 1 Gold Cup at Santa Anita wrapped up. Majestic Harbour, very impressive. Clubhouse right second, then Imperative, Game on Dude, Ladaris running on late, Fury Cab Curry and Salto Del Indio was last. This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off-Track Betting. Missed one of our TV shows? No worries. Now you can catch all your favorite programs online. Simply log on to CapitalOTB.com and click on the YouTube link at the bottom of the homepage. And look for our new podcast coming soon. CapitalOTB.com. Log on today. Welcome back to Down the Stretch, everyone. I'm Mark Asano. And Majestic Harbor, previously a winner of just a minor grade three stakes, upsets the grade one gold cup at Santa Anita by six and a quarter. Clubhouse rides second, imperative third, while the favored Game On Dude finished fourth. Our first guest this morning won the UAE Derby with Toast of New York off a 148-day layoff. Today he's going to try to win the Belmont Derby with the same Colt off just a 14-week layoff. We welcome live via telephone from New York, Mr. Jamie Osborne. Jamie, Mark Cassano welcoming you to Down the Stretch. Good morning, Mark. Jamie, it's very nice to have you. I want to begin by taking you and the audience back to the UAE Derby. Toast of New York is number eight in here. As we pick it up, he'll be stalking second on the outside. As I mentioned, Jamie, he had been away 21 weeks, but you had been pointing to this race for quite a long time. Talk about that, if you would. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting since I've been here. It seems, uh, it seems that, uh, you know, lack of a recent run, everybody in, in the state sees that as a big negative. You know, we don't see it that way. Um, you know, this horse was never going to have many races this year. Um, and so each race is going to count. So, you know, he gets prepared for these races, you know, in, a, in quite a meticulous fashion. So, you know, a, a lack of a run is not a negative to him. It wasn't a negative in, uh, in Dubai, and it's certainly not a negative today. Yeah, I didn't view the lack of a, a recent run as a negative. What fascinated me was you pinpointed this race from a long time out not only did you make it to the race, which is an accomplishment in itself, but he ran so big. Yeah, you know, um, we, you know, prior to his, you know, his last run at Wolverhampton in England, we had it in our mind that we would attempt to, you know, we'd point him at the UAE Derby. Um, so his whole preparation was, was geared towards it. This race um, was kind of in our sight. Um, the Belmont Derby was in our sight, but we had other options as well. And we did, you know, we flirted for a while with having a go at the English Derby. Um, and about 10 days before, we kind of had a bit of a reality check and thought, you know, it's probably not the right thing to do. So from that point onwards, he was always going to come to New York for this race if all was well. Um, so his preparation has been very much geared towards today. Jamie, how did he ship? How has he acclimated? How's he doing coming into this afternoon's Belmont Derby? 
Well, you know, you can only attempt these, uh, these, these little adventures with horses like him if they are the right mentality to, to get on a plane and come to a different time zone. They've got to be the right, have the right mentality to do it. And this horse has been, you know, he's a pretty laid back traveler, you know, so uh, he proved that when he went to Dubai and this time as well, you know, he's, he, he's not a problem putting him on a pallet stick him in the hold of a plane, you know, he eats his hay and he has a little sleep and uh, comes off the other side and wants to eat his food. So, you know, that's a big advantage if we're going to do this. Um, since he's been here, he's been great. He hasn't really done any fast work since he's been here. Um, he's cantered around the track a few times. Um, he's ready for a run. Um, you can just see it in him. He's getting a little bit angry and a little bit impatient, a little bit bored. Um you know, he's ready to run for his life today. You know, he's done all his work back at home, and his work has been very good. Um, you know, I'm, I'm glad the race is today. You know, I'd probably struggle to keep the lid on him for much longer, you know. Unlike a lot of Europeans, Toast of New York has run only once on turf, that being a fifth in his debut versus Maidens. Jamie, are you concerned at all? We'll save course condition for the next question, but are you concerned at all with him on grass? Uh, well, it sticks a little bit of an unknown factor into the equation, doesn't it? And I mean, if you know, if we were running on an artificial surface, it's just something. It's a, it would be a constant, so therefore, you know, it wouldn't give us a concern. I'd say, am I concerned? No, I mean, clearly we brought him across the Atlantic to run on turf, so we, you know, we obviously think that he's going to go on it. We haven't sort of brought him here to find out. He's done a lot of work on turf at home. We took him away to Newbury Racecourse, where he did a very strong piece of work there about three weeks ago. Um, his work part on to go and win at Royal Ascot. It was a good gallop. It was fast turf on that occasion. Um similar, I would say, to what he's going to encounter today. And he moved beautifully on it. I have a very good work rider on him, Jimmy McCarthy, who's a lot of experience. He's ridden a lot of winners himself. And he is adamant that the horse is as good, if not better, on grass. So, you know what, we're, <laughs> this is what we're running on. Uh, yes, it's slightly unknown, but we've done, had enough practice on it to think that it's not going to be a factor. There has been quite a bit of rain at Belmont in recent days. Jamie, have you walked the course, and what do you think about it? Yeah, I have. I have, and obviously when I saw the weather forecast, I was, I was very concerned because I'm pretty sure that he wouldn't want soft turf. Um, but having walked it yesterday, and I don't think they've had a lot more rain, it's going to be fine. You know, I mean, the U.S. view of firm and our view of firm are probably two different things. Yes. And I'd say, if anything, if we hadn't had the rain, I'd be slightly concerned that it, it could be marginally too fast for him. So I'm happy to see a little bit of rain, and I'm sure the track is going to ride beautifully today. Toast of New York will be running on Lasix for the first time this afternoon. Why is that? <laughs> well, obviously, this has created a little bit of uh, interest in the English uh, <laughs> in, in the English press room. Yeah. Um, it's a question of really, you know, Lasix clearly is a performance enhancing drug. Uh, we're not allowed to use it at home. Um, I, my job is to try and win this race. And, you know, in this jurisdiction, you know, it's allowed. So I kind of felt I've got to just give this horse the best possible chance of winning today. I don't want to give him a disadvantage against his opposition. Um, if they're using Lasix, you know what? I'm going to use it too. Jamie, is he a bleeder? And has any racing authority in New York asked you about, you know, whether or not he's bled in the past? Um, yes, I can't remember that. You know, it's... Your, your stance is, and, and listen, you're not alone in this, that if the Americans are using it, we're going to use it as well, but it is supposed to be used for bleeders. Has he ever bled before? Um, do you think anyone's ever asked Aiden O'Brien whether Adelaide's bled? Oh, as I say, you're not the only one here. I mean, 
you know, Europeans routinely use this when they come over. Jamie, before we let you go, have you thought about any future races for Toast of New York here in the States? You said he's not going to run much this year. Any future races on his schedule? Yeah. Um, we thought, obviously, you know, we'll see how we get on today, but, um, you know, it's not impossible. We consider the Pacific Classic with him on the, uh, on the poly track down in Del Mar. Um, we've got the Breeders' Cup as a possibility. Um, he's still in the Secretariat States in Arlington in a month's time, which I think is probably unlikely. I think that might come too soon. But, um, yeah, we've lots of options. We've a couple of options back at home as well. Um, we're going to be giving him a light campaign, really, for, because the, the main plan, the main target for this horse is to go back to Dubai and try and win the World Cup next year. Well, Jamie, we appreciate your time. Thank you very much for having joined us this morning on Down the Stretch, and all the best later this afternoon with Toast of New York in the Belmont Derby. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie Osborne, ladies and gentlemen. We don't have time this morning to get into this topic and the topic of Lasix. But, you know, we will discuss this again because it's, listen, Jamie is taking full advantage of the situation presented to him, as is Aiden O'Brien, as is Gay Waterhouse. But, you know, we kind of always felt that Lasix was supposed to be used for horses who have bled. And we are up to our next break. When we return, Mr. Peter Erton will join us as we go to the break. The New York Stakes at Belmont on the proper surface, 13 to 10 favorite, number two repost. So we'll take a look at the piece of the New York to the break. Back with Peter Erton right after these messages. So the opening quarter mile for Viva Ralviella was just a bit shy of 25 seconds. Gathering continues to lope along, sitting chilly while second after a 49 and four half mile. Repost coupled up there with Scampering, then Tannery, who remains on the inside of inimitable Roman A. So they're midway down the back stretch run. It's been Cara Raffaella so far. Positions have been unchanged in the order. Gathering second, Scampering third, Repost fourth, Tannery fifth. And inimitable Romanet remains in sixth. And they've been that way pretty much for three quarters of a mile in 113 and one. Now the tempo starts to quicken as time starts to tick away. Three furlongs left here. And here comes Gathering with a bold challenge for the lead for Viva Raphael as they turn for home. And Repost appears to their outside as the field makes the turn from the top of the stretch. Tannery in behind horses, still fourth. Still fourth with a furlong to go. Scampering at the rail, inimitable Romanet. Repost kicks to the lead. It is Repost in front. Tannery trying to get to her, but time has run out. Less than a sixteenth of a mile to go, and it is Repost who reports home by a length and a half. Tannery second, front running Viva Raffaella was third. This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off-Track Betting. I got it. Watch me. I got it. Hey! I got something that makes me want to shout. I got something that tells me what it's all about. I got a move that tells me what to do. Relatively Welcome back to Down the Stretch, everyone. I'm Mark Asano on repose for Bill Mott. Joel Rosario rallies to win the New York Stakes by a length and a quarter over Tannery. Our next guest has a fascinating long shot for this afternoon's Belmont Derby in Dance with Fate, who earlier this year captured the Bluegrass Stakes on synthetic. We welcome in live via f telephone his trainer, Mr. Peter Erton. Peter, Mark Cassano, welcoming you back to Down the Stretch. Hey, Mark. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, always nice to have you, Peter. Dance with Fate finished a respectable sixth and last in the Kentucky Derby. What did you think of that performance? 
I actually thought he should have won. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he, uh, I thought he ran pretty damn respectable considering all the things that he went through. He shipped back to California, you know, twice. He went back and forth from the, the bluegrass and there. Then I don't think he got away all that well from leaving the gate. Then I think the first turn, I think he had to check. And then he went about six wide. So, you know, all right, I think he probably could have been uh, maybe third. So I, I, I was pretty pleased with the race, to be honest. Well, today he will be going the same 10 furlongs as the Kentucky Derby, only on grass. And we are about to take a look at the lone turf start from Dance with Fate. It came January 24th in this entry-level allowance at Santa Anita. For our audience, Dance with Fate is number four. Peter, talk about this performance, if you would. Well, it was uh, more of a prep race. We were trying to find out a couple things because he hadn't been out in a little while. And I don't think I had him completely tight for the race, but we wanted to find out if he could, if he could, you know, if he liked grass and kind of use it as a prep for the El Camino Real. Um, he ran huge. I mean, he had a very good turn of foot. He, he was a little bit green down the lane, kind of laid in a little bit. But once he put him on run, he just took off and he did it pretty easy. So it was. Uh, it, it, it led us to believe that down the, in the future, grass could be a, a home for him. Now, this was at a mile. Peter, is he more effective going longer? What's that? This race was at a mile, the race that we're watching. Is he right. more effective going longer? Well, I think he can be. I mean, he has an excellent turn of foot. He doesn't need a good fast pace in front of him. Uh, he, if it's a slow pace, he's up closer. Or uh, a mile I mean, might be a, a little short for him on a on a typical turf course against the good horses like, like Santa Anita and, and Del Mar have because of the, it's a, a bit biased speed. Um, in this particular race, the talent level was, was okay, but it wasn't what we're going to see today. Right. Rafael, uh, uh, Rafael Bejarano rode him for you this day and, in fact, had ridden him in his first six races. Peter, did he say anything specifically to you about how he handled grass Anything about his action on grass? Well, he's always said that he doesn't like, he says he handles dirt fine, but he doesn't like the kickback. And in the grass situation and synthetic, he's able to settle back and then and run his race, not with a high head because he's getting plastered with dirt. So he did say he handled the grass very well. Now, we know there's been quite a bit of rain at Belmont Park over the last several days. The likelihood of less than firm turf your thoughts about that? Has he ever trained over anything less than firm? No, no, he really hasn't. Uh, his gallops over the muddy track here were well. I mean, he did he did fine, but that's not going to be the same thing. So it'll be interesting to see. I mean, he does run well on even synthetics that haven't been the fastest in the world. I mean, I don't think the Keeneland track was all that quick. So I think he, his action is somewhat of a higher action. I think he'll get over... Uh, the longer grass here, I've noticed it, it's a good six inches longer. So when I walked on it yesterday, uh, and I think that won't be an issue. He's not one of those kind of horses that drags his feet, and, uh, and that just could be fatiguing, too, for, for some. But the softer going, um, I don't think it's an issue. I mean, hell, the mile and a quarter of the Derby, that, was, that wasn't exactly a lightning track, and he seemed to handle that well. I don't think the distance... Uh, was a problem there. You had told us uh, earlier this year when we had you on the show that Dance with Fate appreciates some time between starts. He's had nine weeks coming into this afternoon's big stake, so how's he doing? Uh, he's doing well. He's actually, he got was a little bit rusty there about a, a month ago into his work, and then a couple few weeks ago, he, he just kind of got back into it, worked with a nice three quarters and 11 the right way. Uh, galloped out strong, and then his 5-H turf work couldn't have looked any better, to be honest. So I think he's getting his energy back and his uh, sharpness. Well, Peter, we appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having joined us this morning on Down the Stretch, and all the best later this afternoon with Dance with Fate. 
My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Peter. Peter Erton, ladies and gentlemen. And we are up to our next break. When we return, it's off to Southern California, where we'll welcome in Mr. Jerry Hollendorfer. As we go to this break, the firecracker at Churchill. Number five, Silver Max, making his first start since a respectable fourth in last year's Breeders' Cup Mile was the 13 to 10 favorite. So we'll take a look at a piece of the firecracker to the break. Back with Jerry Hollendorfer right after these messages. Of Silver Max, who went 46 and 4 for the first half mile and carries his speed into the far turn. And Regally Ready is now edging up alongside as Free World is back running in third along the hedge. Then it's Nikki's Sandcastle, a ride alongside of Free World. Villandry is next. And then comes Valentino in front. He has led every step of the way so far in Silver Max. Comes into the stretch with a two-length lead over Regally Ready. Nicky Sandcastle on the outside is next in Free World. Is gaining ground on the hedge. Silver Max has the lead coming down to the 16th pole. Free World on the inside. Villandry far outside. Nicky Sandcastle guys reward coming late but Silver Max comes back a winner. It was close for second between Guy's Reward and Nicky Sandcastle. Then came Villandry. This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off-Track Betting. The big day is here. You've told everybody. You've dressed the part. Your heart is pounding in your chest. Your horse is rolling down the stretch. He's coming. He's closing. He's the winner. You're a winner with Parting Glass Racing. PartingGlassRacing.com. PartingGlassRacing.com. Welcome back to Down the Stretch, everyone. I'm Mark Asano. My thanks uh, once again to Peter Erton for having joined us. And Silver Max, Dale Romans, Robbie Alvarado, the last horse to have defeated Wise Dan goes wire to wire in the firecracker by a length and a half. Our next guest this morning will be saddling last year's champion, two-year-old male shared belief later on today in the Los Alamitos Derby, we welcome in live via telephone from California, Mr. Jerry Hollendorfer, Jerry Mark Cassano, welcoming you back to Down the Stretch. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Always nice to have you, Jerry. Um, shared belief was sidelined for a few months at the beginning of this year because of the foot problems. Jerry, was there any point during that time period that you were worried you might not get him back to the races? Well, any time you have a problem, you don't know if you can solve it or not. But I felt like if we kept it after it, we would solve the problem. And uh, so far, we have solved it. Well, you brought him back in this May 26th non-conditioned allowance race at Golden Gate Fields for our audience. He is number four. Jerry, talk about this comeback from Shared Belief. Well, actually, uh, you know, he made the lead, which I, I didn't really expect him to do that, nor, nor did I really want, want him to do that, but uh, uh, that's what happened. And uh, Russell uh, got him out of the gate real well, and, he, and since he broke well, he decided to go on with him, which was the correct decision, but it just uh, kind of surprised me the way he did that. Jerry, if I remember correctly, the fastest quarter mile of this six furlong race was the final quarter. So he obviously finished up very strongly. Right. Well, that's what we're looking for in uh, any of our horses, that they can finish better than they start. So we'll try to do the same thing today. Now, you mentioned Russell Bays rode him this day. What did he have to say to you after the race? No, I think he just thinks that he's uh, uh, a really special horse. And, you know, Russell's ridden a lot of horses for me. He doesn't really uh, make a lot of comments, but he quite likes uh, shared belief. Now, you go to Hall of Famer Mike Smith this afternoon. Why the change? 
Oh, uh, you know, no particular reason, just uh, business. You know, Mike rides here in Southern California and likely uh, shared belief will spend a great deal of his time in, in Southern California. And uh, Russell's uh, riding for me in Northern California, so I just decided uh, to make that change to Mike. Uh, he's a, a big-time rider and a big-time money rider for sure, so uh, we wanted to let Mike uh, get a chance to ride this horse. Now, Shared Belief will be going from a single six furlong sprint to his longest distance in his career, a mile and an eighth later this afternoon. Not, on, on the surface, Jerry, not an ideal situation. Well, there's no ideal situation uh, a, a lot of times, and, you know, you have to uh, do what's available. And, you know, we, we knew this option was available, so we tried to prepare him uh, to go to go that distance. And, uh, uh, you know, he's been prepared on a surface that that uh, really uh, makes horses quite fit that go and get racetracks, synthetic racetracks. So I, I think I have him fit enough, and I think that he's a, a good horse. And, you know, it, it's uh, a little bit to overcome, but, you know, we're going to uh, – uh, be in the big races, we're going to have to overcome problems. That's right. It will also be his first ever start on dirt. What are your thoughts about that? Well, <laughs> again, you know, if we're going to run on dirt sometime, we have to try it. So, I mean, I don't see any reason reason why he wouldn't, why he wouldn't uh, run on any surface. Uh, Candy Ride uh, could run on, on uh, any surface. And, and so, uh, you know, I don't I don't think that's going to be a problem for him. You never know, but I mean, just if uh, my opinion is that it won't be a problem. Jerry, from what you've seen of him after that sprint race, did he get enough out of that single sprint? Did he get what you wanted him to get out of that race? Well, that's a, those kind of questions are they're, they're kind of unanswerable. I mean, we'll answer this afternoon and, uh, and so we'll see. But, I mean, you know, the other, you know, they're probably the second or third favorite uh, in the race is, it will be uh, uh, John's horse, uh, John Tetler's horse, you know, and he hasn't raced since the Derby. So, I mean, you know, does, does he have enough in him uh, to compete? And, you know, if you ask John, John would say, well, sure, you know, we have our horse ready or we will be running him. So, I kind of feel the same way, you know. We, uh, you know, we think we have enough in him, and he worked well enough a after uh, that race up there, uh, so that we think uh, we can get the job done. I know trainers don't like to think too far beyond the task at hand, but Jerry, have you thought about future races for Shared Belief, and is there any realistic chance we could see him at Saratoga? Uh, I really haven't thought that uh, that far ahead. You know, this has been been uh, uh, a major consideration to decide what race to uh, uh, to run in for, for this race. So I'd rather get past today and uh, see what we can uh, cook up for for the future. Uh, you know, we obviously want to run well today, and then maybe we can make some some decisions. But I'm not real anxious to put this horse on a plane right now. You have also entered Tonito M, who was a nice second, two back in the Las Barrera, but he was eighth and most recently in the Woody Stevens. What are your thoughts about Tonito M? Well, you know, uh, you know, Mickey Gonzalez wanted to run in there, and I didn't see any reason why he shouldn't run in there. Uh, he was the best horse in Puerto Rico, and uh, Mickey uh, bought him and uh, brought him over here, and uh, thankfully he gave him to me to train. So we'll see, you know, he's a, a tactical horse or uh, could show a little speed. So, you know, we'll see. Uh, he's also is ready and uh, uh, schooled over at Los Alamitos yesterday and uh, looks well and uh, is doing quite well. Jerry, last year you came to the spa. You were on our show Test Stakes Morning. You won the test later that afternoon. What are your plans? You're going to be bringing anything to Saratoga this summer? I don't know. You know, anybody uh, would like to run at Saratoga if they get the opportunity. So, 
if we have a horse or horses that we feel uh, would run well uh, at the spa, then then we would try to bring them uh, over there across country and and uh, run there. We quite quite enjoy running at Saratoga when we can. Jerry, as always, we appreciate your time. Thank you so very much for having joined us this morning on Down the Stretch. And all the best later this afternoon with shared belief in Tonito M and the Los Alamitos Derby. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Jerry. Jerry Hollendorfer, ladies and gentlemen. You know, this is, this is obviously a very talented, lightly raced three-year-old. But, you know, it's interesting. Nine furlongs off a single six furlong sprint and first ever race on dirt. So that makes the Los Alamitos Derby quite fascinating. And we are up to our next break when we return back here to New York to welcome in Mr. Wayne Catalano. As we go to the break, the quality road at Gulfstream. And again, this is the time of year that you're kind of looking for a three-year-old who could be a major factor the second half of the year. Well, that three-year-old might be Wildcat Red, who was number four in here. He was the three to 10 favorite coming off an 18th place finish in the Kentucky Derby. So we'll take a look at the quality road to the break, back with Wayne Catalano right after these messages. On the outside, Perchango takes it to Wildcat Red in the early stages with best plan yet forced four wide. Three wide and on the top flight is Not Your Average Joe. They line up four across the track after the opening quarter and 22 and four. Nobody messing around here as they head down the back stretch. East Hall loves life, sitting off the sharp pace from fifth, a length and a half better than Shiva Curlin in sixth, and Real Steel is four lengths last in seventh as they run to the half mile pole. Wildcat Red, half to a half mile and 45 and four. He now gets away by a length from second per Chango. Well, not your average Joe is third. Best plan yet is next. East Hall rides the rail with an inside journey. He'll be the stretch danger, followed by Shiva Curlin and Real Steel. But the big shot, Wildcat Red, the Fountain of Youth Stakes winner, sails past the 5 16ths under cruise control, and he's leaving the rest behind. Real Steel does some work from the back. East Hall tries to sustain you a sustained run down inside, but at the quarter pole, Wildcat Red has brought his A game. Wildcat Red flashing his speed for his South Florida faithful. He turns for the money six lengths on top and confidently handled. East Hall left in the wake with real steel and best plan yet. They tried him early, but they can't try him now. Let's hear it for the Fountain of Youth Stakes winner. Let's hear it for Wildcat Red. He's bound for the Jersey Shore. He's wrapped up. He's geared down and he canters in under Saez. Walking home a confident five length winner. East Hall second, real steel third and best plan yet was fourth and 142 and three. This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off-Track Betting. Funding your Capital OTB Bet account is as easy as one, two, three. One, easy money. Clearly the fastest and easiest method of depositing funds into your account. Make deposits or withdrawals in just minutes. Two, Green Dot Money Pack gives you instant access to your funds. Green Dot Money Packs are available at thousands of retailers nationwide. And three, MasterCard Visa. Simply click on the link from the funding page, enter your account information, and fund your account. CapitalOTBPet.com. Log on today. Welcome back to Down the Stretch, everyone. I'm Mark Cassano. My thanks uh, to Jerry Hollendorfer once again. And Wildcat Red, Jose Garofalo, Luis Saez, good-looking comeback, dominates the quality road by 10 and a quarter, the Haskell Invitational next. Our next guest will be saddling dual grade one winner and still improving room service for this afternoon's Belmont Oaks. We welcome in live via telephone, Mr. Wayne Catalano, Wayne Marcusano, welcoming you back to Down the Stretch. Hey, thanks, Mark. Nice to Quite have you, Wayne. Topic. Nice to have you as always. We are gonna take a look at Room Service's most recent victory in the American Oaks for our audience, Room Service number eight. Wayne, she appears to have really stepped it up in her last three races. Talk about the progress she's made. Well, she's really made progress. She's, 
she's maturing. She's doing everything right. She's learning the game very well. I was very impressed with the first race at Gulfstream when she made that run. Uh, she showed me she had a lot of talent when she made that run. And coming off the pace on a speed-biased turf course, we thought big things were ahead of her after that race. And uh, she proved us right. Our last couple of races were, were great races. I mean, even the race on the poly track, and we know she's more turf, but she handled the poly good enough. And, you know, that was a very good race to get up in dead heat with that race. And uh, the coming through the race she did in California, uh, just stamped herself as one of the best three-year-old fillies in the country. You know, the race you were talking about at Gulfstream, the Here Comes the Bride, we, we showed that on our program the week after it was run, and I was very impressed with that. Wayne, do you think it's been the extra distance that has made the difference with her, or, or is it a combination of that with a maturation process? Well, I, I think uh, mainly the experience and, and the learning and, and getting the hang of the game, uh, she's she matured up to be a racehorse, and um, that's kind of like had a lot to do with it. Of course, she found a home on the turf. She's definitely a turf filly, and uh, she, she didn't ha she didn't mind having the polio either. But um, we think she's one of the best fillies in the country on the grass, and we're looking for big things out of her today. Well, she's about to make this nice wide run around the far turn in the American Oaks en route to a two and a quarter length victory. Wayne, talk about this effort, if you would. That effort in California was very good because she, you know, Sean pulled the trigger a little bit early to get a jump on the other horses, and uh, of course it worked out. You like to wait a little bit longer, and, but that was impressive that she can make that that long of a move. And most horses can't run, you know, a good three eighths of a mile like that. You so, and she did maybe a little more, but that was a very good race for her. You mentioned Sean Bridgemahan, who will ride her today. He's been up the last couple of times. Wayne, what's he said to you about her? He said, you know, he really liked the exhilaration, and he thought she's a very good filly all along, you know, from the first time he rode her a breezer and uh, prepping her for the Oaks, and she didn't work as well as we like on the dirt, and Sean said, no, she's not the same filly. We worked her on the turf, and he said, yeah, definitely, she's like two different horses. So that was the reason why we didn't go in the Oaks, and we elected to go to California. Well, it was certainly a very good decision. Now, Wayne, she's been to California and back to Kentucky, now shipped to New York. How's she doing? Is she holding her weight? How is everything going with her? Well, you, you mentioned her weight. She's very light, Philly. She's light made. She's light, she lean, tall. She's very tall, Philly, very, you know, long and lean. But uh, she's holding okay. We're, we're very happy with her in the last couple of three weeks, you know, and uh, that was a decision to come right now. But she's very light filly, and are we happy with her right now? Everything's going well. Now, with all the rain recently at Belmont, the likelihood of a less than firm turf later this afternoon, what are your thoughts about that? Has she ever trained over it? I know one of her early races, it was labeled good at Churchill. I don't know how bad it was that day. But what about the possibility of a less than firm turf course? Well... You know, I guess the jury will be out on that thing, but, you know, if they say the good horses take their track with them and they don't need no excuse, we think she'll be all right on it. You know, we hope that she'll handle it good enough to, to get the job done. But it's a very, very good forecast for today. Uh, I think we were fortunate enough not to get the big rainstorm that they were talking about. I don't really know how much it got and how the turf course will be not racing around here on a regular basis. But uh, from, it, from what I can see right now, we probably should be okay. It said it was very hard and needed some rain anyway. This is quite an exciting race, isn't it? You're facing Europeans. You're facing some very good other fillies from North America for a million bucks. Doesn't get much better than that. No, you know, when they give a million dollars away, it's a great bonus. It's yeah. not going to be easy. So, and then, you know, the Europeans, they come over for them kind of races. Uh, uh, we got, you know, looking at the farm, a glance at it a little bit, they, you know, the mile and a quarter, I guess the jury would be out on them them foreign bread so we'll see well wayne as always we appreciate your time thanks so much for having joined us this morning on down the stretch and all the best with room service later this afternoon in the belmont oaks uh, thank you very much always a pleasure Mark. thank you wayne wayne catalano ladies and gentlemen and we are up to our final break when we return mr chad brown as we go to this break the bashford manor for two-year-olds 
13 to 10 favorite, number four, Cinco Charlie. So we'll take a look at the Bashford Manor to the break. Back with Chad Brown right after these messages. They're racing in the Bashford Manor. It was a very good start. Cinco Charlie goes straight out to take the early lead. Government shutdown is right there with Silver Hill. Then it's Lucky Player in Skyway on the inside. Draw Nye is well behind in the early stages as they run up the back stretch. It is Cinco Charlie on top by a half a length. Silver Hill second and pressing the pace on the outside. Behind them is Skyway in third as they pass by the opening quarter mile in 21 and four fifth seconds. Then Government shutdown who's fourth as they go into the far turn. Lucky Player Player is next and being eased up out of the race is draw nigh. Around the far turn, three furlongs to run. Cinco Charlie taken on by the Texan Silver Hill. And these two are nose to nose on the lead as Skyway is guided to the outside but has come under a ride and they're into the stretch and it's Cinco Charlie on the rail. Silver Hill is right alongside and they're right next to each other, three sixteenths out. Cinco Charlie digs in on the inside he's trying to put away silver hill cinco charlie silver hill keeps on fighting these two in a battle at the 16th pole cinco charlie edging away late and cinco charlie has won the bashford manor silver hill was second skyway was third and lucky player was fourth This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off-Track Betting. Hey, race fans, head down to the all-new Clubhouse Racebook and get in the game. With live horse racing on more than 250 flat-screen TVs, state-of-the-art wagering terminals, fantastic food and drinks, an amazing Vegas-style atmosphere with seating for nearly 900 of your closest friends. Conveniently located at 711 Central Avenue, right off exit 5 of I-90 in Albany, the Clubhouse Racebook is the better choice. Welcome back to Down the Stretch, everyone. I'm Mark Cassano. My thanks to Wayne Catalano for having joined us. And Cinco Charlie, from a debut maiden win to victory in the Bashford Manor by a length and three quarters, over Silver Hill. Final guest this morning will be a busy young man later today at Belmont Park as he's got five stakes starters, including my favorite grass horse, Bobby's Kitten. We welcome in live via telephone, Mr. Chad Brown, Chad Marcusano, welcoming you back to the show. Thanks for having me, Mark. Nice to have you as always. All right, let's begin with Bobby's Kitten and his recent victory in the Penn Mile for our audience. He is number four in here. Chad, your thoughts about this performance, and maybe most importantly, how well do you think he settled in here? I thought he settled well, considering you know the way he's been in the past. I thought Javier did a good job to um, you know ration his speed and, and save it for the end, and it was a, it was a great step in the right direction for this horse. What has Javier said? You know, you've had two grass races with him. We're going to, you know, we're going to toss the bluegrass for a moment. But in his two grass races, has Javier said anything to you about him maturing, about him getting better settling and rating? He has. And, um, you know, he's also mentioned that he's gotten to know him a little bit better now every time he rides him. Um, just. He has the opportunity to, um, you know, form a little bit more of a bond with this horse and to really get to know his tendencies. So, you know, his two grass races this year, I thought he, he did rate well. And I've seen the blue grass. He didn't. He was very rank early and, and didn't care for the surface either. So, it was pretty much a throwout. His turf races have all been pretty good. Javier was pretty critical of the turf course after yesterday's stakes. Have you guys talked about the condition of the grass? We did this morning. Um, you know, it's been breezy and sunny here um, ever since the sun came up this morning here at Belmont. So I think by the time post time comes around, the, the turf should be dried out pretty well. I doubt it will get to firm today, but it will be 
much better than it was yesterday. I'm hoping for a good turf uh, grading by the time post time comes for our races. You and I both know today is a different ball game. Uh, it's, it's not only a better quality field, and you're going to get that for a million and a quarter, but it's a mile and a quarter. Chad, can he rate and relax enough to get 10 furlongs? I'm hoping he can. He's given us every indication in the morning that he, he possibly could. You know, he's bred to run further than a mile. When you watch him in his races, he, he looks like he's a miler. So it's, you know, it's, he's, can he go to his pedigree and settle? And um, I think it's worth a shot. It's a lot of money. Um, the timing of this experiment works well because I didn't have a, a major objective right now in passing up for, for this race. And Javier is pretty confident. We spoke about the last two weeks and together. You know, should we try this? together and he's adamant he wants to try it he's you know obviously he can ride other horses in the race and he's in high demand but he likes this horse and he's confident you know and in, in what he's done this far this year relaxing better he thinks if he can do it in a race like this he, he might be able to take him quite a ways in this race all right, how's he been training up to the race and have you done anything different with him in the mornings knowing that he's got to get a mile and a quarter? Not really. Um, he's, you know, he had a good race at Penn, and he's plenty fit, this horse, and it, it's been a lot of maintenance work and just fine-tuning some behavioral stuff with him. Um, I, this horse has had several races now in his career, had a solid two-year-old campaign, and um, he's plenty fit. If, if he relaxes and he should be able to get the distance, which we'll have to see if he's good enough. Well, you will be represented in this afternoon's million dollar Belmont Oaks by two Phillies. Let's start with Goldie Esponi, who will run for you for the first time. What have you learned about her? What were your first impressions when you got her? Beautiful horse. And I wish I had her a little longer. I've had her for about a month, a little over. I've had the opportunity to breeze her twice. She's breathed well both times, particularly the second time I worked her. She worked much better. She's continuing to fall into place here in the barn and, and get, get with our program. You know, off her last breeze mark on Sunday, I thought she breathed well enough to deserve a shot in this race. So we'll just have to see how she does. And, and coming out of the race moving forward, she looks like a horse that's, that's promising to me. Now, Chad, her last race, at least on paper, I did not see the, the video of the race, you know, w was pretty poor. Have you spoken with her former trainer? Was there any particular reason for that performance? No, I, I wasn't really given any details of that. <clears throat> we just took the approach of um, she was purchased before that race uh, by, by the new ownership group, and they, they left her there to run one more time in that race, and she didn't run any good, and they moved her to Maine. So... I, I wasn't given a lot of details. I just took the approach of, you know, let me get her off the plane and look her over. And nobody forced me into this spot. They just said, you know, if you could run in there, great. If not, if you need more time, pass. So I put her in a accelerated program to at least potentially make the Belmont Oaks. And if there's anything I didn't like, I was just going to pull the plug. But she's had a nice month of training, particularly her last 10 days or so. So hopefully we can got a good cozy post there on the inside and cover her up and see what she can do. You're also going to be running Minorette off a close second here in the Wonder again as we pick it up around the far turn. She's number two sitting in fourth. Tell us about her. She was given to me over the winter, so we've had more time with her. We know her better. And this filly has trained well ever since she came to my bar. We really liked her. Um, She's run two good races for us. I think she's getting better. Uh, I don't think she'll have any problem getting a mile and a quarter. I think she's going to be a top horse over here. And I do think she prefers firm ground. So I'm hoping this turf really starts to dry out this afternoon for her. I think she's much better on firm ground. And there's another filling in here by the name of Excellence, who may in fact be the one to beat. She is owned by Martin Schwartz. Will you be getting her after the race? Yes. So tomorrow we'll pick her up, and then she'll stay here 
for us, and we're very excited to get her. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd be quite excited too. All right, the, today's Suburban got a couple of entrants headed by Last Gunfighter, who has won nine of his last 12 starts. What an honest racehorse. I'll tell you, he's a pleasure to have in the barn. Any trainer would love to have him. He's a very dependable horse, both in the mornings and the afternoons. I mean, you take him to the track in the morning, and he just marches to the track every day. And um, very consistent in his races. So he's training well. He has that one prep race at Penn. I thought he ran well. I thought he got a lot out of it in the Mountain View. And, uh, you know, it should set up well for him going a mile and a quarter. Tough race. It's a, it's a big purse. It's supposed to be tough. That's but right. He's one of the ones I think figures in the race. You've also got the New York bred Zevo moving up in class, a winner of his last five, most of them in tight finishes. Yeah, moving up in class, moving up in distance. So, you know, it's time to test this for us. You know, we, me and the ownership group here, or the owner, I should say, Tom Coleman, we, we spoke about it and, you know, Right in the middle of the year, it's a good spot to try something like this. Um, he's in great form. He likes Belmont Park. Um, you know, if it works out well, then it opens up a few doors for us in open company races. And if it doesn't, there's some New York bread races the second half of the year that would fit perfect for him. So we're, we're planning on running him today as well and see, how, see what he can do. How, uh, ex we all know the answer to this question, but how excited are you? that the spa meet begins in less than two weeks. Are you loaded? <laughs> You're never loaded as loaded as you wish. It's yeah. always, you're looking for a few extra winners up there. It's hard. But we have a great group of uh, terrific owners behind me and, and my staff and working overtime getting ready for the meet. So we're excited to, to be running back home again for sure. Chad, as always, we appreciate your time. Thanks so much for having joined us this morning on Down the Stretch. All the best with all your stakes runners later this afternoon at Belmont. We'll see you soon here at Saratoga. Thank you. Can't wait to see you. Take care. Chad Brown, ladies and gentlemen, and I mean to tell you, um, I think Martin Panza should receive a lot of congratulations for this idea in its first year, both and I questioned how much success they would have with the Europeans. But in its first year, both the Belmont Oaks and the Belmont Derby drew some solid European participation. And you know that if Naira keeps this up and develops this idea, you would certainly think that European participation would become greater through the years for this amount of money restricted to three-year-olds. But congratulations to Martin Panza for this idea. And depending on how bad the turf is, because folks, I have studied and wagered on grass racing for a lot of decades. If it's soft, you simply do not know in advance who's going to handle it and who isn't. And we don't need another intangible into the handicapping puzzle. But if it dries out a bit, should be a fascinating day at Belmont Park. All right, time to thank all the folks who helped get this week's show on the air here at the studios at the Clubhouse Race Book. Uh, Julie Hoxie, our associate producer, great job with five guests, Mick Richards, uh, Pat Peretta, Dino Cantonacci, and thanks to this morning's guests, Chad Brown, Wayne Catalano, Jerry Hollendorfer, Peter Erton, and Jamie Osborne. Not bad for my age to remember all five guests. And thanks to this morning's sponsor, Parting Glass Racing. Saratoga's original racing partnership. Visit them on the web at partingglassracing.com. As always, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so very much for having joined us this morning on Down the Stretch. Enjoy this wonderful Independence Day holiday weekend. Enjoy all the great racing action from coast to coast here at Capitol. And from all of us here at Down the Stretch. We'll see you next week. You're watching OTB TV a service of Capital Off-Track Betting.